Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. You got Stacy with me. Hey y'all. Hey, in this section, we're up on section, we're up on part 8 of the similitude of Hermes similitude 9. In this section, what are we going to talk about, Stacy? We're going to talk about those 12 virgins and the four and then the sisters. Yep, so we're going to spend a lot of time on the definitions of these uh, virtues and what they are, trying to make sure we understand who they are in this section, right? Yeah, we're going to talk about how we sh they're related to um, the tribulation. We're going to talk about how they're related to now. All right, so you guys stick around. Go ahead and hit that like button. Be prepared to give your comments as we go. So long. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Abba, we come to you today, Lord, asking that you will help us with this class, help us to get an understanding of it so that we can transfer what you would have us to, to teach along this video. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. And so be it. All right. So we're up here on verse 140. Ready to get started? Mm-hmm. All right, let's go. 140. And I said, Sir, tell me the names of these virgins and those women that are clothed with the black garment. All right, so here we're about to find out who these women are. Um, what's happened so far? Um, the tower's been built. Hermes has been placed in the tower. And he's, he's getting an understanding of everything that's going on around the tower. And now he's about to, um, he's about to find out who the virgins are. 141. Here said he the names of these virgins, which are the more powerful, and stand at the corners of the gate. These are their names. All right, so the way this works is we have these four virgins who are standing at the, the four corners of the tower. These are the strongest. These are the kind of like the mothers of the other, other three, other 12, other eight. These are like the mothers of the other eight. And they are, but they are the strongest of, of the group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 142. The first is called faith. The second, continence. The third, power. The fourth, patience. The wretch which stands beneath these are simplicity, innocent, chastity, cheerfulness, truth, understanding, concord, charity. So the first one is faith. Okay, so faith is probably one of the most familiar words um, that we use in our um, lingo when we're dealing with um, um, the Messiah, I was going to say, when dealing with the faith. Um, but when we're talking about, I guess, Bible talk, scripture talk, um, faith is one of those common words. And when you ask a person, or when a person says that they have faith, the most common word they use is what? Belief, right? You know, is it just having a strong belief in, a certain, in such a things? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the definition that I came up with, and I'm using this really old dictionary from the probably early 1900s. Um, yeah, old dictionaries are good. Yeah, and it has the definition that... It came up with which makes so much sense to me is the firm acceptance of what another states and then it also says it's more than mere belief so the firm acceptance of what another states so I think I think we was talking about this earlier and we was given the example of okay if you have faith that I'm if I tell you I'm gonna do something and you have faith in that you're you're basically having faith in what I've stated there's, yeah, and what you said you were going to do. There's no other proof other than the fact that I've said that this is what's getting ready to happen. Yeah, and you know, taking it through the through scripture, when the Messiah went about to heal people, it was, remember the lady that he, he healed, or let's take the, uh, the guy that he healed. He said, uh, you know, by your faith, um, get up and, and walk, or, you know, take your right. bed up and walk. And he was going by the words that the Messiah had spoken, um, the words that he had heard about the Messiah, God's word. Um, that's what he was believing in. Um, that's what he had accepted. And um, 
Right. That's all they all they had to go by was. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. What else is that? All you have on faith? What else you have on faith? Um, I wrote down. Um, well, in our dictionary, um, faith is um, considered a na uh, now a thing, but in the Hebrew um, language, in the Hebrew context of the word, and this is old Hebrew, uh, it's a verb. Really? Yeah, it's a doing thing, and that just makes so much sense. That it's a doing, it's called action, it's calling you into action, um, calling you into believing. And I copied this down from um, um, this sister on, um, that I, I look at, and she uh, teaches Old Hebrew uh, from the website, uh, not from the website, but the YouTube channel Royal Roots. And she said, Faith in our culture today is defined as. Knowing that God exists and He can do something if He wants to. That's what um, that's what we think of. He says, "I have faith in God. You know He can do it, and He only do it if He wants to." But it's well, she says, based on intention and feeling. But the Hebrew um, context of the word is based on action. So it's accepting what the Father says. And knowing for a fact that he'll do it. Uh, if he said it, he's going to do it. The Bible states it, it's true. Okay. So. so looking at, you know, where we're at now and you're wondering, okay, well, how is faith, how is faith gonna, going to be a, a necessary element in the tower? And the lack thereof is going to get us kicked out of the tower. I guess what I think of is how we have to have faith in the promises of the Bible, we have to have faith in what's stated there. Even though in nowadays time, it's hard to see some of those promises materializing themselves. You see a lot of people who are teaching against what the scripture says. You know, saying we don't need to keep the commandments and, you know, all of the Mosaic laws are done away with and we don't have to do anything like that. And yet these people are, nothing's happening to them. They're, you know, they, they are seem to be living prosperous, happy lives. And a person who's looking and reading the scripture for themselves, you know, even though they may find, they, even though they're finding a lot of contradictions with, you know, what's being taught in our churches these days, they have to believe what's written down on paper mm -hmm. instead of believing their lying eyes. Yeah, they have to believe it, uh, what the Word says. If the manuscript, if the Word, if the Bible says it, then it's going to come to pass. It's happening now. It's just straight up truth. Okay, you're right. And then going forward, I guess, you know, when things really get hard, yeah. You know, when people are running towards money, when people are running towards other other methods to, you know, I mean, there's people storing up food right now. There's a lot of people putting a lot of faith in a lot of stuff. If we have our faith planted anywhere else besides the scripture, it's going it's going to fail us. And then we're going to find ourselves perishing. Yeah. We're going to perish because we don't have faith in what the scripture says. Yeah. If the scripture tells us. To say, you know, as far as prepping for food, if the scripture tells us to prep for food, then we should prep for food because we know that we're going to need it. Well, the, the, the scripture, it doesn't tell us to prep for food. It doesn't tell us to store anything up. The only thing the scripture tells us to do as far as preparing for this tribulation and all of these events we have coming is to one, adhere to the law. You know, be faithful followers of the law, keeping all of the statutes, rules, commandments, and everything, especially the covenant. But also um, to have charity towards each other. Yeah. And so, and and that's going to be a stretch for a lot of people because here you are, you you have a a mother type figure in a household with children who may find themselves, you know, barely putting making ends meet or whatever, and now you're telling her that she has to give up some of what she has and then go give it to the less fortunate give it to strangers give it to people who don't have as much that's gonna that's that's necessary for her survival but yet she's gonna have to have faith in that yeah mm -hmm. so. that's, and it's gonna take a lot of faith
Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next one. The second is continents. This is the second, we're gonna call them mother, mother figure, one of the second strongest. And this one is simply just self-restraint. Having the, the ability to to hold yourself back from acting. So continence and self-restraint is the same thing. Continence and self-restraint is the same thing, yeah. Okay. So what else you got on that? Uh, for self-restraint, which, you know, everybody knows what self-restraint is. And I got to being able to refrain, being able to abstain from action. Uh, the E-N-C-E means action. And it's, so it's an action word as well, but our dictionary defines it as a now also. Okay. Now, understanding that these are the most powerful ones, I mean, it's real easy to see if you don't have faith, the, 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 you, you can't really expect um, a lot from the rest of these as far as playing out in your life. If you don't have faith, you, you know, you, you really ain't going to worry about self-restraint or none of the other um, uh, versions that, that we're going to talk about. But then when you think about self-restraint, we're going to talk about lust. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about lying. We're going to talk about pride. We're going to talk about malice and, and sadness and pleasure and infidelity. If we don't have self-restraint, how are we going to resist any of these other ones? Right. You know, how are we going? How are we going to fight them off? You know, if you know, for taking for you know, the first one jumps out to me is anger. When I start to feel myself getting angry, is when self-restraint has to step in and protect me from some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And if and if I can't control myself, and if I if I you know if I don't have self-restraint, which means I can't control myself, right? Right. And then when anger takes over, when lust takes over, uh, or pride takes over, then those 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 uh, spirits, those negative spirits, are going to control my life, and then they're going to end up harming me, right? Mm -hmm. So like faith, um, countenance, or self-restraint will be a a a mother or a strong figure, you know, in this. Because without that one, then I have no real hope for, you know, dealing with the rest of them. Yeah, another thing that uh, I'm thinking about with self-restraint is, uh, say you're in a situation where uh, the leader of your home, your, your husband, say, you know, look, we got to do it this way. And you're like, no. You don't necessarily believe that it should go that way. You got to have some kind of self-restraint, you know, in order to hold yourself back from... Uh, trying to I guess take on the leadership position and 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 go your own way you gotta follow after him or or you know bad things could happen or well, well that that reminds me of Willie Lynch and you know how what Willie Lynch did to the African-American race basically turning them upside down putting the woman as the head of the household but you know here going forward that's one thing that we're going to have to learn is that the that the father put man having rule over his family, having put rule having having rule over his wife, and like you say, when you come down to it, and the wife wants to go one way, and the man wants to go another. Let in, in I guess in your example, you have the wife who wants to follow what she's learned in the church and what she's heard all of these years from school and from TV and you know the courthouses and hospitals and everything that that she's learned. And then you have she she believes you're supposed to do things a certain way. And then the man who's looking in the Bible and reading something that looks totally opposite and totally different. That woman now has to put on self restraint and say, you know, or, you know, I'm gonna let the man lead. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a that's a powerful one as well. And the next one is power. Power is the characteristic of a person or a thing that is brought into focus by action and by the fact. Of which that person or that thing produces change morally or physically. So power is is it is it just being able to carry out this stuff? Yeah, it's like I, one of the things that came to mind is that when a person says he has that it factor. 
Okay. You know, that person is able to produce something. Uh, he's able to, to do something, some kind of action, and it brings on a physical or moral change. Okay. In maybe society, in the job uh, uh, setting. Uh, one of the things that came to mind is um, my daughter said, the president. You know, I said, well, when a person thinks of power, what do they think? They think of uh, the president. Mm -hmm. This person, by his action, he can bring on a different action that is either uh, a different change that is either morally or physically. Okay, um, he can make stuff happen. Yeah, he can make stuff to happen. So when we, a lot of times when we think of power, we think of strength. You know, she has as power but that word is also used in scripture but as far as the virgins from my understanding it seems like it's talking about they're able to make a a change um, by their actions morally or physically and I one of the things that came to mind is money it says money you know money is power right if you have money you have have power the ability to do something or act in a particular way, especially as a faculty or a quality. Yeah, well, power, in this case, dealing with these 12 virgins, power is what's going to be the thing that helps us to do the rest of this stuff. Hmm. I mean, we have to put on truth. We have to put on cheerfulness. We have to put on harmony. We have to be long-suffering. But if we're weak... How are we going to be able to do this stuff? If you're truly weak, if we are a weak individual, we don't have any power, how are we going to be able to put on cheerfulness? That's going to take a certain level of power. Right. Right? And, and you know, same way with the rest of them. Long-suffering, you have to be a little, a little bit, I mean, the weakest person in the world can be impatient. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't take it doesn't take much to be angry with anybody. You know, that's, that's real easy to do. But that person who... Find this search, find himself in adversity, being being you know being picked on, being messed with, um, with all the opportunity in the world to be angry, can put off anger and not be angry. That's power, and and I believe that's what it's talking about here when it's saying that we have to have power, we have to be able to put off maliciousness we have to be able to put off sadness or you know and that kind of thing because if we can't then it's going to get the best of us so would you say a better definition was to be able to change both morally or physically to be able to to change to use an action to change things well you, um, you you're changing remember a lot of a lot of these negative virtues are natural to us right we were taught this in preschool you know we you know you first day you walked in preschool somebody snatched something out of your hand right. you know and hit you with it you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying and so you you immediately learn to be angry you 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 learn to tell lies you know when you know you you learn that you'll get you was gonna get your butt whooped when you talk when you told the truth mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying they basically beat the truth out of us right and made us start lying well now you know as adults you know especially being this late in the game we're having to unlearn these things right and we're having it yeah we're having it and so there's your change in which you, when you're changing from being an angry person to a cheerful person or when you change changing from being full of malice to being innocent right mm -hmm. so yeah so and it's going to take that power to to make that change so i think your definition is right i mean okay our next one is patience patience is the quality or habit of enduring without complaint you know it sounds like the word meek remember the, the scripture says yeah. the meek shall inherit the earth right yeah. you know and it sounds like meekness you know when you know that's what i think of long suffering i always think of somebody stepping on my foot or doing something to me mm -hmm. and you know instead of you know getting angry or, or lashing out or you know even you know screaming out real loud you know you have to endure like your definition say endure without complaint yeah mm-hmm endure something without grieving or it distressing you and then you know and then I, I guess some other things you could think about or patience is when you're thinking about these promises of the father and some of the things that were promised but that we're not yet seeing that haven't been materialized in our life 
we're we're having to you know just wait on them like it goes back to faith having faith that you know of the things that we on faith in the things that we can't see but yet we have to be patient in order to wait on some of these things mm -hmm. you know yeah. a lot of these promises we're not going to see until after the tribulation yeah yeah so those are the four strongest and we're going to briefly run wait, wait, before we before we go too fast you say well how is and i don't know if we said this about power but how is long suffering how is patience going to save our life in the tribulation and you know how's it how is the lack of patience going to get us killed well i would say having patience is just waiting even though your uh you know things seem to be getting worse or or, or things are are manifesting you know badly in front of your eyes you have to not only have the faith that the uh, what the Messiah said will happen, but you're gonna have to have that patience to endure it. Right. So and and the, the so patience really has two different, at least two different paths. I'm not a you know expert on you know the American language or whatever, but one is waiting on the promises, and the other one is having long suffering with our neighbor because. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on in this tribulation as far as um, hatred, maliciousness. There's going to be, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about wars and we're talking about all kinds of stuff going on. And there's going to be, in my mind, there's going to be plenty of opportunities where people, our neighbors, our friends are going to come at, come at, going to come at us, you know, with with anger or come at, come at us with backbiting or, or being slanderous or being malicious towards us and we have to be long suffering towards them and not lash out not retaliate against them because if we do it's going to end up being in a fight and then we're both going to end up perishing I mean I, I mean does that make sense I mean yeah I would say yeah because uh, not only during the tribulation but now yeah now. now i mean everybody's dealing with it now but you know this is kind of like practice time if somebody does something to you and you retaliate against them now probably nothing's bad going to happen to you but there's coming a day when things are going to get so bad that you know when you retaliate against that person that person could harm you the person may pull out a gun and shoot you yeah i mean at one point they were calling your names and then you started calling them names and now they're throwing bullets at you or, yeah. you know, trying to harm you in another way. That's that's where the world is headed to right now. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, a lot of the wicked, the, 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 and I don't want to call them wicked, but that's why the people who will not refrain from the negative virtues are going to end up killing each other. It's because, you know, think of like anger. This is going to go back and forth until one of them shoots the other one, you know. And so these, like you said, these are the the strongest, most powerful of all 12. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we touched on power that much as far as how power will kill us during the tribulation. If we don't have power, if we, you know, if we're powerless, if we're weak, then, you know, we're, you know, we're going to let these other negative virtues have their way with us. Even yeah. though, yeah, even though we may know we're not supposed to be angry, being weak during the, during the worst parts of the tribulation is going to end up letting anger take over us and you know mm -hmm. then you know somebody's going to end up getting harmed or hurt yeah all right so you know and then the rest of these these eight these other eight they kind of stem off of off of the uh the four the four mm -hmm. so uh next simplicity uh and we'll briefly talk about that which is uh the state of being uh plain unadorned simple right um, I think in the, in in some part of the Shepherd of Hermes, he he explained uh, simplicity as not really needing a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not having to have a lot, like you said, being simple. Um, I always I always point back to the person you know who the opposite of si a simple person. You know that don't sound good in modern day language, but the opposite of a person that is simple is a is a person that is complex. Mm -hmm. and a person that's hard to deal with you know at, at one point you know I know I was complex I was hard to deal with and you know it's like the little you know things that people would do 
you know, certain things will agitate me or get on my nerves or stuff like that. That's a complicated person. The next version is innocence. And for that, we have the state of being free from evil or guile, being okay. free from deception. The way I understand the tribulation is out of these 12 negative virtues, the, uh, these 12 negative virtues, they're going to be amplified. They're going to be increased. They're going to be widespread. Whereas we're seeing a little bit of them now, we're seeing a lot more than we used to see. They're going to they're going to steadily be ramped up until, you know, you can imagine mass chaos in the street with, you know, our neighbors out there fighting one another, mm. you know, and so that so there will be a lot of people being malicious and a lot of people being malicious towards us. And if we don't have a solid grasp on innocency or the lack of evil or guilelessness, then we will start to partake in that with them. Allowing them that negative virtue to take a part on us and dragging us back to back to those back to you know back to those wicked mountains back to yeah. the mountains. It's going to, that mean if once we start to partake in it, it's going to grab us and it's going to start to drag drag us back to where we came from. Mm -hmm. Next is chastity, state of being undefiled, unpolluted, unclean. All right, let's start. Well, what does this mean? Because there was one person who made a comment and I'm sure there's a lot more that's thinking about it that when it says being chast being chaste or having chastity means being celibate even though people you know have been married for all of these years you know there's some that'll argue and I think there's people that you know are single but they'll argue that we're all supposed to be celibate mm. that's not scripture <laughs> Yeah, no, that actually breaks the first commandment. The first commandment of the Bible was to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. So to now come back and say that you're supposed to be abstinent actually puts a, a contradiction in the first commandment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, actually contradicts a lot of other stuff going on in the Bible. So it can't really mean that, can it? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that uh, you're not clean and you're polluting yourself. So does it mean breaking the rules, breaking the commandments? When it means being chases, it means uh, abstaining from wickedness? I would say if you're defiling yourself, you're committing wickedness. And if you're being chased, then you're, you're not, not committing wickedness. How is chastity a matter of life and death in a tribulation? Well, if you're not defiling yourself, you're not, uh, as we said, just said, uh, you're not committing um, trespasses against God's word. You're not uh, polluting yourself with uh, the things that the Father uh, consider unclean. Um, you know, you, you're being pure as far as all of the other statutes, rules, commandments, and everything. You're just being being true to the word is is what it sounds like like it like it's trying to say. Yeah. The next is cheerfulness, which means in good spirits, joyful. Cheer is a shout for joy in a, or in praise or encouragement, give comfort or support. Um, so to be cheerful means to be full of joy, full of praise, and full of encouragement then, to be yeah. cheerful. And you can see how that is going to be able to help in the, in the tribulation, encouraging someone. Yeah. You, know, you can do this. Uh, you know, Father said that, you know, this was going to happen. You have to have patience and get through it, you know, encouraging people. So I and can see how that will play a big part of it. Yeah. And so that one's easy to see. Truth. The state of being true, which means not false in relation to uh, your knowledge or your speech. Okay. Now, so truth. When I think of when I hear truth in this, it, it, I always think of the word and how, you know, we we having truth, you know, in the Bible, truth in the, in the Word of God. Because me personally, I believe there's only two true things on the planet. Math and the Word of God. Math and the Scripture. You know, that's the everything else is subject to you know the way somebody feels or thinks or believes, you know, there's only really true to, I mean, history, you think of that, that's, that's a matter of interpret, that's, that's up for interpretation, the English language is up for interpretation, uh, even a lot of elements of science 
are up for interpretation, whereas math is not. You know, 2 plus 2 is always going to equal 4. And, you know, the Bible is the only other thing in the planet that you could count on to be 100% truth, 100, you know, all of the time, no matter what, you know. And so when I think of truth, that's what I think of is the scripture. So how is that going to, well, that simply tells you how it's going to play out into the tribulation. Truth, the, uh, the word of God. Yeah, because that's that's the only thing we have to survive with. You know, that's that was the purpose of the Bible being written anyway, is to help us get through this tribulation. You know, people, you know, the, especially the ones who don't read it, don't really get that part, is that these are instructions for our survival. It's telling us what we have to do in order to survive this tribulation and live on past this huge bump in the road. There's, there's about five... Five billion people about to die over the next seven years, you know, and only those that that are promised survival are those who um, adhere to the law, adhere to, you know, the, the covenant, adhere to the word of God and those who do what the Bible says and are, you know, involved in a lot of charitable deeds towards their brothers. Only those two types will survive. And the only way you know that is if you know that the Bible is true. And when you think of, you know, those that you even think of lying in, this, in that aspect, you think you're talking about people who are contaminating the word or not speaking the word truthfully, actually, you know, you know, preaching or teaching something that's contrary to what the word of God says. And that's going to end up getting people killed. Well, while you said you're sitting there thinking, I'm like, you say that the Bible is the book a book written for our needs in the tribulation we, we're going to need to know all this stuff for the tribulation yeah right and i'm thinking that well do we need the bible now because you know people who who don't read the bible who don't you know know nothing about the lord are neither care they're you know they're living fairly decent pleasurable good some you know rich lives well and yeah. and they don't need the bible they're not reading the bible uh so is it a book that we need now or what we're needing to be doing now with the bible is studying it learning the laws learning how to use them following the the commandments and the mandates so when the tribulation does come we'll know these things in order to get through it or do you well, see what I'm you, well, you have to understand when you when you when you're talking about people who are living without the scripture and seem to be doing well without the scripture, you have to understand that we live in an Egyptian culture or a Babylonian culture, and that's what these people are using to to be successful. Have you ever heard anybody say they're riding the goat? The, the Masons are riding the goat. What what that means is, I mean, they 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 might have a little a real goat down there for just for show or whatever. But when they say they're riding the goat, what they're talking about is using those principles for success. Whereas me, I may I'm riding the Bible. I'm riding the Scripture, trying to get what I need out of it. You have other people who are using other means, tried and true means of success, and they are riding those. So you say, well, do we need the Bible? It depends on what your goals are. If you just want to be wealthy in this world and live a comfortable life, no, you don't. Actually, the Bible will will actually get in the way of that a little bit right, yeah. because it's because the Father wants us to live a certain way according to you know you know the way he put the way he built this planet. You got to remember before he put Adam and Eve on the planet, he put everything they needed on the planet for them. So six thousand years ago, the Father said we had everything we needed. But you think of all of the stuff we've created and invented since then. A lot of that stuff was created and invented for satanic purposes, believe it or not. This computer that we're working on, this table that we're working on, these headphones that we're using to make this class were all created for the intent of Satan. Uh, you know, we can use them for good purposes, but Satan needs this kind of stuff. He needs chairs. He needs houses. He needs cars and roads and buildings and, you know, running water and all of this other stuff in order to have itself materialized in in in, in the future. You think, it, 
it may be hard to believe, but you go in and you look at CERN and you look at the, the medical industry that are that are learning how to transplant human heads and all of this stuff. All of that stuff is necessary to manifest Satan into reality. He's actually going to be put in a, in a human body at some point as the guy we're calling the Antichrist. It's actually going to be Satan walking around in the flesh. But what that's going to take is the miracles of science to get him here. And so you think all of the things that had to be in place in order for science to work, you had to have cell phones, you had to have televisions, you had to have eyeglasses, you had to have, you know, all of this stuff, even even stuff like razors in order for these guys to shave and be down there in the, in the meetings looking clean and such. All of that stuff was necessary for the manifestation of Satan. You say, well, do we do we have to have that stuff? No, we don't. So, so what you say? Do we need the Bible? It just depends on what your goals are. Do you want to walk with Father, or you know, do you want to walk with Satan? Yeah, well, you should consider doing a class with the question: Do we need the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Take it too long. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, next one gas, is next one is understanding. Understanding simply means to make known. Understanding to make known. Now, I think it's real easy to understand how truth is is going to um, be a matter of life and death in the tribulation. Um, in fact, you know, there's a lot of bad things promised for those individuals who are not teaching the truth to his people. You know, you look at like Jeremiah chapter 14, um, and 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 what it says, what happens to the false prophets and such. You see that truth is gonna it's gonna drag people. I mean, uh, the lack of truth is gonna drag people in the in the wrong direction. Mm. Now, understanding. So, what's the difference between understanding and truth? Under knowing the truth. Well, what was the definition of understanding again? To make known. When you understand something, you 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 it's being made known to you. Okay. Now, some of the other words used is intelligence or. And that with the opposite being foolishness. Right. All right. So. So okay, you have the truth. I guess. I guess. I give. I, I can give you the truth by giving you a Bible. I can put the truth in your hand by putting a Bible in your hand, or putting anything true in your hand. You know, I can. I can. I can. You know, pull up some. Pull up a psalm, or I can pull up a proverb and put that proverb in your hand and say, "Here is truth." But you know. It may take you days to get an understanding out of that, mm -hmm. you know, like even like Hermes. I mean, we've had the truth for 20 years, you know, you know, but but some of this understanding is just now coming out. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. OK, so so and so well, so we can we can understand how understanding will be life or death during the tribulation. But like I said, because if you, you you can have the truth and not have any understanding of what of what you believe in. Yeah. Like like if I was to say, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's truth. Right. But do you do understand you, what do you understand saying? what's being said there? Right. The father wants you to be the head, not the tail. Right. Do you understand what he's saying there? Right. Because you know a lot of people can get the misunderstanding and mm -hmm. think you know, uh, uh this means that he wants me to have you know a brand new Lexus, not an old not not an old Ford Escort. Mm -hmm. You know he wants me to have he don't want me to live in a 1984 mobile home. You know he wants me he wants me to be the head. He wants right. me down here in you know some of these five hundred thousand dollar brand new houses that they're building. Right. You know so so yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. The next being concord, which means uh, you live in harmony with agreement. Harmony and agreement with with each other. Right. Okay. Um. Well, I can I can see that harmony, harm. Get so basically getting along with each other. Right. Okay. Now I can start to see why this is kind of at the bottom of the list there. You know, whereas these other ones seem to be, uh, I ain't going to say more important because you have to have all 12 of them. But by the time you get down to, hey, we're just going to get along, you know, we it's going to take, we, we've already cheerful, we're mm -hmm. already chased, we're already, you know, being right. truthful, we always had an understanding. And you, but when you get down to concord and harmony, um, you need to have conquered all those. Yeah, you need you, to have yeah, yeah learned all those. 
Right. You have to have those in order to to have harmony with a, another. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And the same goes for the next one, which is charity, and that says uh, giving liberally to the poor. Yeah. Alms giving. Yeah, charity or love or, you know, it's one thing to say I love you. It's another thing to actually show love. And that's why, you know, it's this this William Wake edition, which, you know, is the way, the, the translation that we found in the Lost Books of the Bible, Forgotten Books of the Eden. I believe it's the most, most important one. Um, it, uses chas- it uses charity while the other ones uses love, mm-hmm. you know. And charity, you know, that takes effort. Yeah, action. It takes, you have to have action. Yeah, I noticed with a lot of the, um, the old Hebrew words, it's always action. There's action behind them. Yeah. There's doing something. Yeah. You're always constantly doing it. Yeah, and charity is extremely important. I know that one, I, I, we've done classes on how charity is going to save people during the tribulation because that's, that, that's your only other hope. I mean, you you can be the 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 Bible expert. You could be the, the the law expert. You can be an expert on the covenant, which is Exodus chapter twenty through twenty four verse seven. You can read that every day or whatever, and be those that are going to survive inside the ark based on the law and based on you know your understanding of you know what we're supposed to be doing as far as these biblical instructions. But how many people are doing that? Here in what we in July 2019, out of all of the population on the planet, how many people would you guess are doing that right now? Not very many. I mean, out of our, if you was to say out of a hundred people, how many people are doing it? I, I know you're guessing, but just take a guess. How many people would you say are following the rules of the covenant? Ten. <laughs> I'd say one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say one. I, it's absolutely nobody doing this. You have to. You you, you think it, it, the. It, the majority of people who claim to be Christian, claim to be believing in the Bible, they're going down to the church. And they are te- they are teaching opposite. They're telling you you don't have to you don't have to keep the commandments or the rules or the statutes or the judgments. You know, you start talking about the book of the covenant and they start telling you that Jesus did away from that and you don't have to do it. So how many people have have put down the church and got away from the, the, the church doctrine and have now gone back and picked up the Bible and read it for themselves and are doing it? Yeah, I say I say less than one, less than one out of 100. I say one in a thousand. I say you could do the math right now, and you could say that there's 7.5 billion people on the planet. As a matter of fact, we, I, can, I can show you how many people are doing it right now. I'm going to say population. Population in the world, 7.53 billion people on the planet. Copy and paste this up here. Divided by, guess what? 144,000. 144,000, and then we know that uh, one third of the 144,000 are actually have actions in the spirit world. So we can take that number and divide it by two thirds. We're going to say two thirds of the 144,000 are actually walking around right now. So we can say out of, out of, uh, 7.5 billion people on the planet, only about 35,000 are actually trying to do what the law say. Mm. Only only wow. about 35,000 people over the whole planet are actually trying to do what, what the scriptures say. That's the purpose of the 144,000. That's why they're here, is these are the only people who are actually trying to do what the scriptures say. And that's, that's why some religions, like, you know, they... Uh, Seven Day Adventists, no, the Jehovah Witnesses believe that they're the only ones that survive is, you know, because they're the only ones keeping the rules. They're the only one doing the rules. Yeah, so they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, not, and just as a side note, the 144,000 are not the only ones that survive. There's actually going to be some other ones who are going to be, you know, paying attention to, you know, paying attention to the 144,000 that basically following behind them. They will survive, too. But then and then you have the family members, you know, that's with them and all of that. So the numbers will increase. But my point is, is that if you ain't in this number, which the majority of people ain't, you know, the majority of people ain't. Uh, what is it? We'll, we'll look. 
All right, so you, you're looking at only 35,000 people who's physically walking around right now who are actually trying to do what the scripture says to the latter, actually obeying all of the statutes, precepts, commandments, judgments, ordinances, you know, basically doing what the living out the Bible. What about the other 7,465,000 people that's on the planet right now? What are they going to do to survive? Well, in order to, for them to have a chance to survive in, they have to have charity. The only other way, other than keeping the scripture and doing what the Bible says do, is to be charitable towards your brother. And I stress this because the Bible tells me to. It tells me to stress to people that you have to perform charitable deeds. If you're not keeping up with the law like you know you should be, then you need to start giving away stuff. You know, I hate, I, I hate to say open up your wallet because, frankly, that's the least of your actions that you can do is give away your money. Mm -hmm. But you need to be giving away your time. Mm -hmm. You need to be giving away you, what else? I mean, if, if you're good at something, you, you need to be doing stuff for other people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I found myself, I, I found it hard to, to do charitable deeds nowadays because, you know, I don't really have a car. I don't really have money or, or, or a way to do stuff. You know, and the Bible tells me that I could pray for people. And I do do that to get charitable deeds. But there's some days, like yesterday, when I feel the need to actually go out and try to do something for people. And so what did I do yesterday? I jumped on my bicycle and started riding around the neighborhood looking for people to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I actually found somebody. A lady just from out of the blue just comes up to me. She's got bags all over her. She's carrying stuff. And she comes up and she says, I need help. Mm. I need your help. I said, well, lady, you the one I've been looking for. <laughs> <laughs> me and this lady goes walking all over town. I'm carrying her bags. I'm opening the door for her. I'm, you know, basically being her little helper guy. Uh -huh. I, I, I left her in a wheelchair. Back in the thrift store, I've been pushing around in the because she she had just got out of the hospital. Right. And yeah, she just had surgery and all of this stuff. Uh -huh. And when she got to the got to the thrift store, she was like, first thing she asked them for was a wheelchair. And so I was pushing around in a wheelchair. And when she finally caught her breath and you know felt better or whatever, she was like, I'm good now. And I left her. I'm like, where I'm going? And I ended up leaving her there. Charitable deeds. That that is the only that that's part of our survival. That's how we're going to survive this thing. Is actually doing stuff for other people. Well, the world tells us that you know, God helps the one that help themselves. Yeah, blessed is the <laughs> child that has his <laughs> own and all of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. No, nope, the 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 thing is, he all he, he what what the scripture actually says. Because I don't know if that's in the Bible or not. You have to look that verse up, see if it's actually in there. That is not in the Bible. It's not. Uh uh. No. <laughs> what's what's actually in there is that he puts people in our way in order to give us the opportunity to 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 gain merits. He put that lady there just for me to gain merits. Right. You know, just for me to to gain those little bit of points that I obviously need. You know, he put her there for that reason. Right. You know. Yeah. And you know. And that's and, and I give that story because that's what you guys in the listening audience have to be doing, looking for opportunities. You riding down the highway and you see somebody, you know, on the side of the road with with, with, the, with their tire blowed out. Yeah, you're supposed to stop. Mm -hmm. you, you see somebody, you know, trying to get their groceries in their car. You know, they got a bunch of kids and they struggling. You're supposed to go help. Mm -hmm. I, I was over and I was in the hood, you know, yesterday, too. I was trying to gain as many charitable deeds as I could. I was in the hood, and there was a um, there was an elderly gentleman in a wheelchair. One of my friends, he was in a wheelchair, and you know, he don't really like people helping him. But as he was pushing his wheelchair up the hill, I ran over there and grabbed the back of his wheelchair. I said, "I'm gonna push you up this hill, whether you like it or not." And he, he laughed a little bit. Usually he fussed, but he laughed, and I went ahead and pushed him in, the, you know, pushed him in the shade where he wanted to be at. You know, it wasn't that big a deal to him, but those merits are necessary for the survival in the tribulation. And, you know, that's what it's talking about, charity. We have to be looking, actively looking for ways to help people. Yeah, because there's going to be this mother who uh, who has wasted all her time, all her energy, playing, seeking after money, uh, seeking after fame and all this other stuff. And you know this, right? While you're here uh, struggling. She's going to be without during yeah. the tribulation, and you're still going to have to give her that charity. Yeah, the, the same lady that's riding past you right now right. in her luxury car, you know, right. on her cell phone. She ain't got time enough to even throw her hand up and say hi. 
one day is going to find herself, like you say, in need. You know, that day is coming for all of us. You know, that's that's part of the tribulation is that, you know, the world is going to be humbled. He says there's an earthquake that's going to shake down every building on the planet. So you can imagine how much charity, how much charitable opportunities are going to be available. And if you are a person who is selfish and you don't believe that you're supposed to be, you know, helping out anybody, then, you know, you're going to be on your own. You know, and he promises us that it's not really survivable without his help. The tribulation is not survivable yeah. without his help. We have to have angelic help. Angels actually stepping in to help us if we want to survive this thing. It's going to get that bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go briefly go on to the next scripture, which speaks of 143. Go ahead. And 143 says... Whosoever therefore bear these names and the names of the Son of God shall enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah, and we talked about this in the, in the other classes, how, you know, without these virtues, you're actually taking the name of the Father in vain. Mm -hmm. even, even the Messiah had to put on these virtues. He had to be innocent. He had to be simple. He was chaste. He, he had understanding and truth. He, even the Messiah, walking around in the flesh for 33-odd years, had these positive virtues. It was necessary that he put on these same virtues, or even he wouldn't have made it into the tower. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I'm sitting here thinking, uh, the, our forefathers did too. Yeah. Moses, Abraham, they had to have these virtues as well. Yeah, they would have. Thinking, thinking about how tough it would have been for Moses with those two million people if he hadn't had these virtues. Patience. Yeah, if he had to have patience, if he was an angry person, right? You know yeah. what I mean? If he if he was a complicated dude to deal with, yeah. You know, if he was running around sneaking and you know, you know, breaking laws every once in a while, or if he didn't care nothing about the truth, he come out there and said, "Thus saith the Lord, y'all supposed to do." Yeah. <laughs> if he didn't care about the poor, you yeah. Know, they they were they were all poor. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and that was the same way, with, with, that would have been the same way with the rest. What if Jacob didn't have these traits or, right. you know, you know. So, yeah, they all of our forefathers were like that. You know, all of our forefathers had these traits. They were all like that. 